Good evening, friends. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live and uh, really glad to be back with you guys again. Uh, we were on the road again, as you guys saw from our trip there in Atlanta. And the message this evening is called In the Midst of Aliens. Now, it is a lot of the information I even shared in Atlanta, but we're talking about going much deeper tonight than what I did in Atlanta. And I, you have to understand, I was getting revelations, revelation while I was speaking there in the, uh, the, the, the message that I delivered there in Atlanta there. Uh, and as a result, the Lord just really began to pour out things to my heart in ways I never even could imagine. Talking about a trail of the Nephilim bloodline, it is incomprehensible. I just trust by God's grace that I will not mess up, that he'll, he'll help me to bring out everything to you tonight. So I really encourage you, even if you've heard that message, listen to this one. There's a lot of information you've not heard before. And I retitled it In the Midst of Aliens because it has a lot to do with some of these revelations that I think are going to really uh, bless your heart as well. And uh, uh, one thing I want to share with you before we get started here too, I did a message, uh, I posted on the Dunan Institute, it was also on Israeli News Live. On Israeli News Live it's titled Return of the Nephilim. Uh, on Danun Institute it's titled Proof on How the Nephilim Will Return. And Danun Institute is uh, 1.3 1 million views already. I think it's about a million views on uh, INL as well. So the video has been seen well over almost two and a half million views at this point right now. On that message there, that actually aired on national television here in the United States when we used to be on national television on direct TV. And it has really stirred a lot of people because I show from the book of Enoch uh, what I believe, a conjecture of course, but from all the different proofs about things that have been going on in the Antarctica since the time of when Obama was president, the visits of John Kerry, etc. And from the book of Enoch, I discovered that the seven summits uh, down in Antarctica very, may very well be where the fallen angels were imprisoned, according to what the book of Enoch actually writes there. Now, I bring that up because of what we're going into tonight, but also uh, because I got an article from uh, Sister Rosa uh, sharing with me that the little in Chile, right there near the Antarctica, uh, the temperatures are staggering, 39 degrees Celsius. That's over 100 degrees, friends. Oh my goodness, you have no idea. I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's unheard of. It is unheard of. In the, uh, the Antarctic is also 30 degrees warmer than it's ever been. Record-breaking temperatures at the Antarctica. Uh, so what does all this mean? I, I don't know. I know I have been given, a, I, I had a private conversation. I cannot say even who, but I do know far more details now about from my own source that had shared with me from, from the White House, uh, from the Pentagon sources there, uh, what is actually coming and we are talking about something that is just unimaginable. I, I don't know if I want to share that information here on this message. This is a different message here. But uh, I can truly see from the looks of things that what's happening is these fallen angels are wanting to try to prepare to rebuild after a major calamity on the earth. Uh, we are looking maybe, and I don't know the dates of anything, but maybe a year away. I will say this much to you, though, of what was shared with me today. Uh, I told you back from my uh, White House source that come September, there wouldn't be anybody on the planet that doesn't know we are in serious trouble. Now, that was deeper confirmed to me today as far as what it is that we're supposed to see that's going to confirm this. Well, you're going to be able to see the, the, the um, let me just put it plain and simple to you, what many are calling Planet 10, Planet 9, Nibiru, etc. Whatever you want to call it, it is going to be visible either in 
the fall of the year here, August, September. And if it's not visible then, I was told that they believed then it would be visible to the naked eye by the spring of the year. Now, I don't understand the differences why, but I, I learned a lot of information. Uh, some of the information I already knew, some of it I did not know. You know, and this thing does have a tail. It does have a lot of debris in it. And uh, this thing is going to come between the earth and the sun. And when it does, that tail is gonna be striking the earth. Could that be the judgment that Jesus Christ will bring against these devils that are on the earth? It's a good question. It's an answer I don't know. I know the scripture in Revelation speaks about the earth being pummeled with stones about the weight of a talent, fiery stones coming down the earth about the weight of a talent. That, if I understand correctly, that's a hundred pound rocks. Yeah, it seemed like it would bring some serious judgment as we've been stating to you all along. When Jesus returns, he's coming in judgment. All right, let's get into this exciting message because I am very excited to share this information with you. Uh, I told you guys I'd gotten this email, and this was from Israel's Institute of Biblical Studies that sent this to me saying, uh, Shalom, Stephen, not many uh, e expressions in Christian history have, have, been, uh, have been misunderstood as, or, or, and misinterpreted as badly as the words of synagogue of Satan from Revelation 2.9. Gospel tells us many occasions Jesus' ministry took place in a synagogue and Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Therefore, it is clear that God couldn't consider synagogue to be some satanic place. What is the meaning of synagogue of Satan? And then, of course, you can click continue and learn more about it. And as I mentioned before, listen, I have no problem, Israel Institute, you know, teaching, you know, Hebrew, things like that. You know, I swear I do. I'm in the uh, final uh, fourth, fifth year of the uh, Hebrew studies there. I do private lessons. Uh, but I will tell you this. When it comes to teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the worst place you could ever get that information from would be a place such as this. You know, it just it doesn't, doesn't make sense. Right? And the whole point is, Jesus never was saying that a synagogue was evil in the first place. That's not what Revelation 2.9 is even implying. Now that's really what brought about this message to begin with. Because what I'm watching as I go along here, as I am seeing that many of the Christian ministers allegedly Christian ministers. That's why I named it originally, the wolves have entered in. They're actually wolves in sheep's clothing. They are trying to get Christians to go back up underneath Talmudic rabbis and learn that way. And we're seeing a, a major movement uh, of, of all types of ministries pushing uh, rabbinic teachings for the, the, the church, for the believers. You know, now, I was born to, to parents that were Jewish descent. They, of course, they were not practicing Jews, but uh, it has always had, gave me a heart for my people. I have longed for my people to recognize that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. Uh, and, and, and I was a, a diehard Zionist as a result of these things. Not knowing, you know, unconditionally standing with Israel. We literally had a Facebook page called Unconditionally We Stand With Israel. You know, and, and if you think about it, it makes absolutely no sense. How, why would we stand unconditionally with Israel if God doesn't stand unconditionally with Israel? All right, think about it. And, uh, but because of the love of my people, I was just, you know, even though I knew the title said that, I didn't go along with all the things that Israel was doing. Uh, but it, it still, we had that type of a Facebook page and Literally, we were standing so adamant with Israel because, you know, we were looking at the prophecies, putting all these prophecies in the future, you know, and many of these prophecies are prophecies that were actually already fulfilled. Now, I don't say that all prophecies fulfill, by no means it's not, but there's a lot of prophecies that through futurists, through Darby and Schofield eyes and glasses that we, most people are using, uh, we end up putting a lot of prophecies in the future that were never taught by the early church fathers nor the church all the way down until the last, say, maybe 100 years or so. So this is where all the scruples come in. And of course, many of us, we fall into that camp and we teach a lot of these things. And, uh, and it's even, we got scripture where it talks about, and the law shall come out of Jerusalem. And so therefore now it's being taught 
by all these evangelical teachers and stuff and messianic teachers that you need to go underneath the rabbis because the law is going to come out of Jerusalem. Well, the law came out of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. So I, I see no need that we need to go and, and backpedal, right? Makes no sense whatsoever. So we repented. We came out of this. We changed the name of our Facebook page. Uh, because as I said, if God does not stand unconditionally with Israel, then we should be the same. And, and quite frankly, the way we need to look at this is, what was it like 2,000 years ago? That's really the scene that's being set up today. The Pharisees were in control of Israel 2,000 years ago, along with the Romans. Uh, they had an alliance together, and uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the true Zedekite priests were living down in Qumran. Uh, they had been driven out. They were calling those Jews up, and in, in, uh, including the Pharisees and Sadducees, they were calling them sons of darkness. And they were having to, to stay on the run constantly or in hiding. And then Jesus comes along and he is persecuted. His, his, his disciples are persecuted. Anybody that dare follow his ministry is persecuted by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees. Majority, it was Pharisee persecution. All right. Now, so if we look at today, and we see that there is a resurgence of a Pharisaic rule in the Middle East, in Israel. We also see a cooperation between Rome and the Orthodox Talmudic rabbis. Now, when I say Pharisaic rise of today, let me clarify myself. If you were to listen to anyone such like, like for example, Tobia Singer, Rabbi Tobia Singer, or uh, Nehemiah Gordon. Um, both these men are Jewish. Nehemiah is a Karite, but he comes from a, as he'll tell you, a Pharisee family, a background. Uh, and they will both tell you that the Orthodox Jews of today are the descendants of the Pharisees. Why? Because in Orthodox Judaism, you have to be descendant. You have to be able to take your lineage and prove it back to the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago. After all, they're the ones that were more prominent and stayed in power and controlled everything all the way up to, to the modern times. All right. So the point being, they've not changed. The doctrine is still the same. They still can't stand Jesus. The Talmud makes that very clear. And here we are in the days today. And Rome, like it was 2000 years ago, has made a covenant with the Pharisaic uh, group there in Israel. All right. They totally, the, 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 uh, Suppression of the true believers that are in Israel. We're talking about Jewish believers in Israel. It is just like it was 2,000 years ago. So the thing is, is what side would you have been on? Would you have been on the side that stood with Jesus and the apostles? Or would you have been on the side and ran over to the Pharisees and just come check out Jesus and what he was doing to see if he was giving some new revelation or something and then run back and tell the rabbis what's going on, only for later to bring about his crucifixion? That's where we're at, friends. All right. And so I wanted to share with you these things because uh, when we see, think about the wolves have entered in, they have truly entered in. Now we're going to go into this in a much deeper way than you could ever imagine. So bear with me. I want to start with you with Matthew chapter 7. We'll go verse 12 to 16 here. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law of the prophets. Enter you in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go, uh, go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. All right, now let me clean my glass a little bit better. I got something on there. Maybe I touched it. Let's see. There it was a little better. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. That's very important. We notice that terminology. All right, you beware of the false prophets. So they look like what? They are wearing sheep's clothes. That outer appearance of who they are is like a lamb, a sheep. But inwardly, what's within that being there is a ravening wolf. Now, it's no coincidence, verse 16. Jesus then says, you shall know them by their fruits. 
Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Wow. I have read this. And I mean, most of us, we get the part, you know, you know, the tree by its, fr by its fruit. All right. If you go out, you see a tree, my, you know, apple tree and, and, and uh, especially we'll say citrus trees, uh, a lemon tree and an orange tree, very similar looking trees. But you, you might not be able to tell them apart necessarily unless you're, uh, you know, an arborist. I think that's what it is. Arborist and those difference in trees. Uh, and until the fruit comes on them. And once the fruit comes on them, then you know, oh, wow, yeah, that's a lemon. Oh, that's a grapefruit. Uh, that's an orange tree. That's an apple tree or pear tree. It's what the tree bears is how you know what it is. All right. So we kind of always got that. Yeah, okay, you know, if their works are good, then we know they're godly. If their works are not good, then it must be, must be a devil living in there. Well, he just warns you that false prophets... They come in sheep's clothing. They look just like the real tree. But what is it? It's inwardly they're ravening wolves. It's the sap in the tree. It's a bloodline inside that tree that determines the life. And that's the way a tree is. In the sap of the tree itself has a lifeline inside of it. It's a genetic code, if you were. And whatever that life is inside of that tree is what brings out the apple or a pear. It brings out an orange or a grapefruit. But it doesn't bring out any other. All right. Yeah, you could graft in a limb. You could graft in a lemon limb into an orange tree because the tree is citrus. And the lemon limb has a different life, so therefore it will bear a lemon, but it comes from the root. The root is giving it its life. All right? But, now watch this, though. That's how you know, too, about the sheep's clothing, right? But then he says, Do men gather grapes of thorns? Right? Whoop. Grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? I'm like totally blown away by that. I could not help but think when I saw that of Genesis chapter 3. All right? Now, <laughs> just catching my notes here before I move forward there. I saw something that I didn't want to make sure I didn't miss that there. All right. And Genesis chapter 3, if you remember, Watch, watch the verbiage of all this. Now, I'm going to focus on verse 18, but we got to read verse 16 as well so it makes more sense to you. Watch this. Verse 18. God tells Adam, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth for thee. Why? God curses the ground for his sake. And then he tells him it's going to bring forth thorns and thistles. All right? Now, let's back up. What did Jesus say? You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorns or figs of thistles? No, they don't. A fig grows on a fig tree and a grape grows on a grape vine. All right. Remember how Jesus says, by their fruit, you shall know them, right? right. So you don't get it out of the thorns and you don't get it off of no thistles either. All right. So let's go then and look at Genesis. He's... The beautiful thing about what we're seeing here is that Jesus is giving you an analogy that's literally written all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. Let's look at, let's start with verse 16 and really unwind this. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy pain and thy travail and pain shalt thou bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. That's the famous scripture that all the men like to use to run back and say, well, we, you know, God put a man over the woman. Now, that's a different subject altogether. But let me clarify something for you men real quick before you go anywhere with that one right there. The fall had taken place when Adam and Eve, before the fall, they were co-equal. They ruled together. And, but after the fall, something happens. That spirit of God that once led Adam and Eve, the spirit of life itself was now interrupted 
by sin. And as a result of that interruption there, Adam, as a consequence, would rule over his wife. See, it says, Tushutecha. All right? It literally, that when it says, Tushutecha, it says there, all right, let me back up and share some of this with you. Ve'el ishach tushuktecha. All right? And, the, and, and she, the woman, would actually turn to her husband. Because of his fallen state, he rules over her. Why? Because she had that direct relationship with the father. They both did. Now that, that direct relationship had been hindered by sin, and both of them are in trouble, and because he's bigger than her, he rules over her as a result. Now that actually will flow right through the scripture as well. If I had the time, and you can go to my website, excuse me, not my website, but go to my uh, YouTube channel, Israeli News Live. I have a, a specific playlist about women and their role in the Bible. And I'll share with you what Paul says, uh, the teachings that Paul does in there as well. Go and listen to those teachings there. It's, a, it's amazing the, 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 the damage that was done to Paul's ministry because people did not, you know, and, and listen, this is just translators that, that make these errors. You know, it's not that if you read the original Greek or the original Hebrew, that's not where the error is. The error is when the translator decides, well, I think he meant this. And they get the idea, like in the case of Hebrew, well, I think he meant this because it says that the husband's going to rule over. Well, actually, in Hebrew, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say, and thy desire shall be to thy husband. No, it doesn't say that. Ve'el ishach. And to your husband, she will turn to him. Okay? Ta shuk decha. That's, it, it's, it's a consequence because of his, uh, 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 the whole situation. I don't want to stay on that. I apologize. But anyway, the point being, and also too, the whole thing about the travail and pain, this is actually in sorrow. You see, in other words, it was a prophecy. God knew he knew God doesn't multiply. It's not, oh my gosh. It's actually El Haisha Amar Haraba excuse me. Harabe Arabe. That is the one that was lying in wait. There was an enemy, which was the serpent. He's the one that multiplies the woman's pain. And that's literally translated the one lying in wait, I think in the book of Numbers. Exact same word. But instead of saying, instead of it being that God's multiplying her, her, all this, you know, it's the one that's lying in wait that, that multiplies all this pain and sorrow. Why? Because see, God knew that Cain would rise up and kill his brother Abel. And it would cause one sorrow for his mother and pain because they were both her sons. You understand now? All right, but anyway, what's important though, so let me just stop just for a moment so we really clarify this. What's important though is that we understand that it is through the birthing of children that something is happening in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. There is a prophecy here about what the woman is going to suffer as a result of what the serpent has done to her. All right? And as a result of that, not only will it cause her a great pain and sorrow over her children, it will also cause her husband to rule over her. Then we get into verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In toil shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. That's just one issue. Then he says the next one. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you. And thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. 
all right now the end thou shalt eat of the herb of the field that's the conjunction the word and it's giving you of another thing okay they were eating of the fruit of the trees now they're going to eat the, eat the herbs of the field but we immediately assume that the thorns and the thistles that are being brought forth just means that oh by the way while you're growing your 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 beans and your squash and everything you're going to be pulling out sticker briars all the time no no just as there was a prophecy of what the serpent done the one that was lying in wait causing her this great sorrow and pain by her children killing one another and her husband to rule over her there is also now a prophecy to Adam not only did God curse the ground for his sake but you got to remember man was taken from the ground and so therefore also what's going to be brought forth to him are thorns and thistles all right so now back up if you follow me with this revelation it's a beautiful revelation right beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly inward inwardly they are ravening wolves you shall know them by their fruits everything is that allegory right do men gather great grapes of thorns or figs of thistles no they don't no they don't so what does this have to do with the men that are inwardly ravening wolves their fruit tells you what they really are the grape coming from a grapevine, Jesus is referred to as, I am the vine, ye are the branches. Israel is referred to as a fig tree, right? She's, he's, she's referred to as a fig tree, but it doesn't bear thistles. The Pharisees were from a thorn bush. That's what they were from. You know how you know they were from a thorn bush? Because they plaited a crown of thorns and placed it upon his head. That was the only fruit that they could bear to Jesus Christ when the Son of God came on the earth to take away the sins of man, to redeem him back to the position that he had been lost from. But because they didn't have grapes, they weren't from a grapevine and they weren't from a fig tree. Oh, you say, but they say they were Jews. Well, we're going to find out if they were Jews or not in just a minute. Not to mention Jesus, if you remember, my wife had that beautiful revelation we shared with you before about how that when Jesus cursed the fig tree, he said, let there not be forth fruit come from, the, any, uh, from, from this day henceforth. And I'm just paraphrasing it. And then when they came back a little bit later, his apostles marveled and they said, how soon the tree doth, doth wither. It was, it was just dying right to the ground. Why did Jesus curse the fig tree? Israel represents the fig tree. Israel could not produce fruit. Why couldn't she produce fruit? They had become thorns and thistles. They no longer had the ability to produce fruit except for a little tiny remnant that was intermingled among them there. And so, because of that, Jesus cursed the fig tree. He knew that that fig tree could never bring forth fruit again. And yet, we've got ministers. I think there are, I think there are in many cases, some of them are just blind. I agree with that. Because the Bible says, if the blind lead the blind, they, don't they both fall in the ditch? That's what Jesus said. If the blind lead the blind, let them alone. They both fall in the ditch. All right? But you got these well-known evangelical and messianic ministers that are out there taking the people and saying, come, you need to go. You know, and some of the evangelicals, they're not saying you go study under the rabbis, but they're telling you, well, the law is going to come out of Jerusalem. I used to believe the same thing, friends. Okay, look, I can't fault these guys on that issue there. I understand that. But I am begging God, do something to wake these ministers up. You know, I mean, I've picked on Paul quite a bit lately, but let me tell you something. If God could just open that, that brother's eyes, if he was eyes would open up, do you know how many people we could help? I mean, so many people that followed this ministry followed Paul's ministry as well. And do you know how many people we could help, brother, if he just would wake up and recognize what's going on? All right, but here, listen. So... 
<laughs> victory is cursed. It can't produce fruit again. That's why they need Jesus Christ. All right. So <laughs> it's going to get better. Watch this here. Watch this. So Genesis, thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. That thorns and thistles are Nephilim. Nephilim are fallen angels, those that have interbred together there. And we're going to get into this, so just bear with me. That's why I call it in the midst of the aliens, or so however we titled this. I forget now what we called it. All right, let's look at Jeremiah as well. I, I bring up Jeremiah 33 because when I'm making this point about these analogies and what they mean and how they actually represent beings, not just that when he says, you know, that you know, the ground will bring forth you thorns and thistles. God was literally saying to them when he said, or saying to Adam when he said that, that it's going to bring forth thorns and thistles, that there's going to raise up a Nephilim bloodline. I, I realize that may be hard to believe, but just follow what I'm saying. Now here's another allegory. This time, though, is speaking about the coming of Jesus. All right, Jeremiah 33, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, right? that I will perform that good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel, concerning the house of Judah. Keep that, that verse in mind, because remember, many people are still in that mindset, oh, the house of Israel's got to come home. They got to come home they gotta, in order to know who Jesus Christ is, and then the scripture's going to be fulfilled. Oh, okay, so we're going to say that this Rothschild uh, creation is fulfillment of scripture. It's not. All right? Look what it says, though. All right. Perform that good word which I have spoken concerning the house of Israel and, the coming, uh, and concerning the house of Judah. In those days, at that time, will I cause a shoot of righteousness to grow up unto David. A shoot. Semach. That's what that is. Semach. La David Semach. Right there. La David Semach. Now, bring this out for why. What's the reason? When you're looking in Genesis... And it talks about thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. Okay? It's right. I didn't highlight it and I can't highlight it in here now. I apologize. Okay. Uh, where am I at here? Getting the wrong. wrong here we go. Right here. Semach tatzemach lecha. All right. That bring forth is again. In David's, uh, or Jeremiah 33, when it talks about it, it calls it a shoot. I will cause a shoot of righteousness to grow up unto David. In Genesis, when it talks about thorns and thistles, it says shall bring forth. But it's the verbiage, it's the Hebrew verbiage that I'm trying to get you to understand that shows that in both cases it's using the semach, but it, it literally is as an allegory bringing forth these children. Now, let's go deeper with this. I'm going to take you to Matthew chapter 13. And you can actually get, see this also in the Greek Matthew, the one we have in uh, King James Bible there. But in the Hebrew Matthew, it really stands out. That's why I wanted to share this with you. So let's, let's read this right here now. We're going to go to verse, I think it's verse 25. Uh, yes. Let me back up to verse 23. That which fell into good earth is the one who hears the word and understands it and makes fruit that is from good works. He brings forth from the first a hundred and from the second sixty and from the third thirty uh, and and for the hundred, and, uh, and this is the one purified in heart, sanctified a body as a sixty. And uh, okay, he's explaining the parable. Now, it's a little worded a little different in uh, uh, King James Bible there. But we get to verse 24. He set before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sows good seed in his field. All right. It came to pass when the men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares over the wheat that is, Berega, and went away. And it came to pass when the herb grew up to, to make fruit, he saw the tares, and the servants of the master uh, of the field drew near to him and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed? Then whence cometh the tares? He said to them, My enemy did this. 
uh, did this, excuse me, his servant said to him, we will uproot the tares. He said to them, no, lest you uproot the wheat, but let them remain together and grow up until the harvest, until the time of the harvest. And I will say to the reaper, gather the tares first, bind them individual bundles for burning and the wheat put in the granary. All right. <laughs> I, now, I taught this to you guys a little while back. So, just, so I'm just bringing this back to your memory. When Jesus talked in the Hebrew Matthew about the tares, and he talked about that the enemy sowed them over the wheat, literally, it's ve al chachatim. Okay? He sowed them on top of the wheat. That is so profound when you see that the tares are sown on top of the wheat. That's a mingling of the seed. That is a mingling of the bloodline. Now, this is literally an idiom. This is a, this is a Hebrew idiom that you would have had to have been from 2,000 years ago to really understand the parable. But I know myself for a fact that the Jewish people of 2,000 years ago, when he said this parable, at least those from the Qumran community, they knew what he was talking about. Because when you read the writings that they wrote, and I didn't have, I didn't put this in here. Uh, I think I've shared this on a video recently, though. They actually say the Qumran community is quoting several passages from the Old Testament. When they're talking about how that uh, the, the, the priest mingled their seed together, then they go and they're quoting Old Testament passages where it says you're not to sow mixed kind of seeds in the same field. And you're not to wear your garment with with diverse types of, of material, which we know this in the, in the Bible would be, in other words, you're not to, 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 to uh, mix wool with linen. In other words, you don't take cotton and you don't take wool and take the fabrics together and make it one garment. Why was the law written in there like that? Well, the Qumran community shows you why. They, they knew that that was speaking about how that they would mingle the seed Right, as we have in the book of Ezra, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit, so I don't want to go into too, too, too deep right now, but Ezra clearly identifies that the priests mingled their seed with the peoples of the land. Now, the peoples of the land specifically were Hittites, Perzites, Jebusites, Moabites, Egyptians, etc., which were all known according to the biblical passages, and you'll see this in a little bit, they were from Nephilim bloodlines, fallen angel bloodlines. So like it was before the flood, it was after the flood. As Jesus said, as it will be in the coming of the Son of Man, he quotes this out of Matthew, what is it, chapter 23? He said, as it was in the days of Noah, that's actually what it says, as it was in the days of Noah, they were eating, they were drinking, they were given and given, and given in marriage, you know, well, okay, just sound like they're a bunch of gluttons, right? No, you got to go back and find out what were they eating, what were they drinking, and what was the marriage all about? See, that, that's what you get with, with these seminaries out there. Cemeteries is really what they are. They produce a bunch of dead preachers, okay? But that's what you get when you come out of these seminaries. A bunch of dead folks. They don't learn nothing worth a flip. And this is what gets me about those ministers, you know, they, they just, they don't go back and research and see. And the book of Enoch, literally, we've got fragments from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Literally, there was a full, uh, also, canon of it as well, that one of the uh, scholars who since has passed on that studied the Dead Sea Scrolls got to see uh, some of the microfish uh, copies of that uh, from a, a buyer that was, I think, over in... Uh, Oh, uh, Kuwait that bought that one there. But if they used it, it shows that it wasn't just the Ethiopian community. So to me, it's good enough for me to, as, a, as a source of uh, 
for, for study of uh, historic value. And this is what I like to do when I study a lot of these documents. But at any rate, we find out though they were eating flesh and drinking blood and the marriages was that of the Nephilim. Uh, this kind of takes me though to Exodus chapter three. This is what I wanted to share with you next. Now I've talked a lot about uh, the uh, specifically Hasanai, this, this bush that was on fire uh, and God speaks in the middle of the bush there, how that the word Sinai is a thorn bush. This is really what that, that, that I, it actually is. And of course, again, we go back to the revelation where Christ, he was speaking in an unknown language from the midst of a thorn bush, from the crown of thorns that was on his head. He's speaking from the midst of that uh, the, the crown of thorns, which also showing that beautiful type, how God spoke from the midst of the bush uh, uh, to Moses, speaks right out to him. So anyway, uh, verse 2 says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside now and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. That's so important, that statement there. And I didn't highlight uh, Hasanai, which is right here. This is the part about the, the bush or the thorn bush. That's exactly what it is. But Belibat Esh Mitok, okay? So there was a fire, and the angel was in the midst of the bush. And then God himself spoke from the midst of this thorn bush. Now, you might say, Steve, why are you putting so much emphasis on that? Well, two reasons. One, the revelation I shared with you just a moment ago, Christ himself was in the midst of a thorn bush as well, with a crown of thorns upon his head, speaking from the midst of that in an unknown language, Lama Sabachthani, which they do that as like a Hebrew transliteration, with my God, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Okay, we have that, but the scripture says it was an unknown language. Nobody really knew what he was saying. It took the apostles to be able to write it later to tell us what he was saying. But he was in that in the midst of the thorn bush as God was when he was there on Mount Sinai. But it has a deeper significance that I never caught before. And it has everything to do with what we were just looking at here. All these beautiful passages, right? Uh, as we've just been looking at, okay? You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles, right? No, because the, the one that bears thorns and thistles, as I said to you, the only thing the Pharisees and Sadducees they, they could do at that time in the Romans was, was to give him a crown of thorns. They plated a crown of thorns and put it on his head. You know, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, in the Hebrew Matthew, it actually puts that on the Pharisees. Uh, they just put in their soldiers, I think, and so everybody assumes it was the Romans. No, it wasn't the Romans. It was the Pharisees that put that crown of thorns on his head because that's the only fruit they had. All right, that's all they could bear. All right, so that brings us to what we were, what I was saying to you. Like, see, even in Genesis, right? Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth. There was a prophecy of a Nephilim bloodline. You're like, well, Steve, that's like reaching. No, it's not. You're going to see, right? So when God was in the midst of the bush, or, or excuse me, he was speaking from the midst of the bush. He wasn't in the midst of the bush. He was in that fire, but the bush was not being consumed. Okay, what is it? God was showing you that even when he came to Moses, it was a prophecy that Christ would be in the midst or the middle of the thorns, the Nephilim bloodlines that were on the earth at that time. And when God came to Moses, it was no different then. Because in Egypt, they were among a Nephilim bloodline. Do you know that scholars believe, uh, actually this is Arabic scholars, believe that Taphanes and... Um, uh, one other word there, I forget which one they are, uh, over in the uh, Old Testament, they believe that they were actually Nephilim bloodlines. And we find this too, uh, even in the writings of Ezra, as we're looking at that. So, what is he doing? And the angel Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. Belabat ish mitoch. From the middle of the fire, but that bush, that Sinai being, meaning thorn bush, he was in the midst of it. But the reason why I say this is so important, 
Moses turned aside now to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. Moses wanted to know, why is that bush not being burnt? Well, if you look at the parable of Jesus that he does in Matthew 13, that's why I put it on the same page, you'll know why the bush was not being burnt. All right? It's even in the parable, right? Verse 25, And it came to pass when the men were, uh, were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares, literally, on the wheat. They were crossing, mingling the seed. Okay? That is Berega, and he went away, and it came to pass when the herb grew to make fruit, he saw the tares, and the servants of the master of the field drew near to him and said to him, Did you not sow good seed? Then when sin to the tares? Where he said, My enemy did this. The servant said to him, We will we will uproot the tares. He said to them, No, lest you uproot the wheat. That's why the fire did not consume the thorn bush as a type showing that when Christ came on the earth at that time, he would not consume the Nephilim bloodline. He would not destroy it at that time. That is for his return. That's when he will burn everything. And he even says it in the parable. Watch what he says. The parable, he says, let them remain together and grow up until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, gather the tares first and bind them in individual bundles for burning and the wheat put into the granary. That's his second return. So when people are looking for the coming of Christ, yes, it's coming to burn off all these devils. All this mingled tares, these thorns and these thistles that cannot produce fruit. That's what that's about. And I trust it blesses you as much as it has me because I never realized that in the midst of that bush, Christ was in the midst of the thorn. He was in a thorn bush as well when they crowned it on his head. It showed that he was surrounded literally surrounded with that thorn bush on his head like that showed that he was surrounded by Nephilim. Thorns, thistles that could not produce fruit. They could not produce grapes, neither could they produce figs. There are those that say they are Jews and are not, Revelation 2.9. Now, let's move forward. Jews can learn from evangelicals. I threw this in there. This was because uh, there is so much going on uh, in the world today. Everybody wanting the Christians to go learn from the Pharisees. And, you know, I don't just say Pharisees to, to be degrading. The point is, is this is what the Orthodox community claims today. They claim to be the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago and boast over this. They need Jesus Christ. We don't need to go and learn from them about the gospel. They need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ from you. Wow. All right. Luke chapter 11. And it came to pass. Okay, this is another... I'm bringing these up because these are teachings uh, and I kind of got into the revelation of that so I kind of got sidetracked from all this. But... These are some of the teachings that I have done over the years that God gave me beautiful revelations. But in some cases, like in the one about Luke 11, I got that revelation misplaced in the time frame. All right. And so I want to share that with you. Let's look at this now. And it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as, as in heaven, so in earth. Now we know the rest of the prayer. So for the sake of time, because I know I'm being really long-winded, I won't go into all that detail as of right now. But those of you that have been around here for eight plus years, you may remember that face there with no facial hair when I first began to teach there. This was in 2011. The Lord's Prayer reveals the return of the house of Israel. All right, the Lord's Prayer reveals the return of the house of Israel. Well, it did. 
But the problem was, I was still thinking that the return of the house of Israel was a future event, not knowing it had already been fulfilled. All right, listen to this. Watch this though. Ezekiel, uh, because, well, let's go back to the prayer again. Jesus says to them, you, you have to really look though what's being done. The disciples are asking him to teach them to pray. And when he does, he goes, okay, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. That literally means to sanctify. Some might say hold it in high regard, but to sanctify your name is what it means. And I remember when I would look at that, I would think, okay, how does God sanctify his name? Oddly enough, God had revealed to me what was going on. And not long after that, I had a debate with a uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, teacher that was brought up the issue about the Lord's Prayer to me. And he's a very nice man. I appreciated him tremendously. But he, he said, you know why when Jesus said, pray our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He said, you know that means to sanctify his name. Well, I knew that. All right? I knew that and I knew what God had revealed to me about it. He says, he says, Jehovah's Witnesses are the only ones that have sanctified his name. He said, we put the name of Jehovah back in the New Testament where it had been taken out and also back in the Old Testament where all the churches have taken it out. I said, that's not correct. And he's like, oh, yes, it is. I said, well, it doesn't line up with the word of God. And when I said that, the point I was making was from Ezekiel chapter 36, right? And it says here, verse 19 to 22, and I scattered them among the nations, and they were dispersed through the countries according to their way, according to their doings, I judged them. Now, Ezekiel 36 is speaking about the house of Israel. Not the house of Judah, but the house of Israel. Then he goes on to say, And when they came unto the nations, whether they came, they profaned my holy name, and that men said of them, These are the people of the Lord, and are gone forth out of his land. But I had pity on my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, whither they came. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations, whether you came. Continuing on. And I will sanctify my great name, which hath been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in the midst of them, and the nation shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all the countries and will bring you into your own land. And I, shall, and I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean. From all your uncleanliness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. And a new heart also I will give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. All right. Now, in order for God to sanctify his name or to hallow it his name, the house of Israel had to return home. Now, I got God give me this revelation, but I got the timing mixed up. I thought they hadn't returned home yet. I wasn't paying attention to when Isaiah said, Though Israel be as the sand of the seashore, yet only a remnant, a small number that is, would return. I totally wasn't thinking about that. I wasn't thinking about Acts chapter 2 in verse 36 specifically, where Acts chapter 2 verse 36 uh, talks about Oh, well, let's just, let's take a look at it. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to leave it. Let's go right there and look at it. Okay. We, we can't just leave these things undone, folks. We, we got to get to the truth of the matter because the problem is the people don't know the truth. All right. So let's close that out right there. Let's take a quick look. Uh, okay. Book of Acts chapter two. And here we go, King James Version Bible. I, I happen to like it myself a lot, right? Now, if you, you got to remember, you have, on the day of Pentecost, 120 that are in the upper room is the house of Judah, remnants of the house of Judah. But on the day of Pentecost, we also had a large group of people from all over the world. According to Acts chapter 2, 
Uh, it says here, and this is after they come to the house of Judah, those that remnant that believe the words of Jesus Christ and they were filled with the Holy Ghost because Jesus said, stay there until you're endued with power from on high. In fact, he even breathed upon them and said, receive ye the gift of the Holy Ghost. He was doing that. Why did he breathe on them? Do you know why he breathed on him? Because in Genesis, when he breathed on Adam's nostrils, it says, Ipak chayim. He breathed into Adam the very fruit of, of the tree of life oh my gosh you know we're on this whole idea about fruit and stuff i've got to share that with you as well all right so let's just let's go to it we got to go right to that as well uh, and and most of you know it you've been there you've done this with me so many times you already know where i'm going with all this but here it is right there on your screen all right Alright, and then the Lord God formed man. He forms him. He molds him of the dust of the earth. And all right, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Alright, that word life, chaim. It's right here. Let me highlight this for you so you see it. Chaim. Okay? There it is. The chaim is what he breathed into him. That was a fruit. How do I know it's a fruit? Well, in verse 9 right here, we have the tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Right? Oh, wow. There's another beautiful revelation again. I didn't even know that one there. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Because remember, when Adam and Eve, when they were thrown out, he said, now that the now the earth was only going to yield four thorns and thistles but the tree of life at one time was right there in the middle of everything right and that was what it was the tree of life and that is what the eighth chaim chaim so if the tree is a tree of chaim life and god breathes in adam's nostrils chaim what was he doing he was breathing the fruit of the tree of life into that man and he becomes a living soul and he does it plural form so that not just Adam, see, the man just becomes, ve, uh, ve, uh, ve, excuse me, veyahi ha'adam, okay, and the man, le nefesh chaya, he becomes a living soul singular, but it's plural because why? Eve is inside of there. John the Baptist received the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Why? So did Eve. She received the Holy Spirit while she was yet inside of Adam. All the beautiful things that we have in here is just amazing, but everything is types of trees. Tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's nothing but the law. You eat of the, you eat of the law, you're going to die. You take of Christ, you'll live. Because why? Christ is a tree of life. Adam and Eve were given life, but that tree was then guarded so that the fallen mankind couldn't take of it. God knew there were going to be tares. He knew there was going to be thorns and thistles so he couldn't allow that tree just to be there for anybody to partake of all right had to be somebody that would believe his word all right so i have to go i had to go to that oh wow this is exciting i'm so excited to, to share these things with you all right so anyway and we were talking about over oh, oh let me go back to the book of acts again so we were in acts and as I said, they were Perithians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Cretes, and Arabians. We do hear them speak uh, uh, in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one another, what meaneth this? Others mocked and said, these men are full of new wine. That was your Pharisees and Sadducees that were hanging around, right? But Peter, standing over the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, you men of Judea and, uh, and you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you. Hearken unto my words, for these are not drunken as you suppose, but this is but the third hour of the day. Now they were from all the known regions of the earth at that time. And they were Judeans. Not just Judeans, friends. If you go to verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Oh, wow. The house of Israel had came home. The remnant, though you be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant would come. Wow. That's why we're looking at this. That's the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36. That's what we were talking about when we said in there that uh, 
uh, the Lord's Prayer. Back up to the Lord's Prayer there. See, Jesus was telling his apostles, pray part of the prayer, just part of it. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He knew what it took to sanctify his name. The house of Israel had to return as well so God's word could be fulfilled. You know, Israel, the house of Israel was scattered for the same reason Judah got scattered, and that was for mingling the seed. Oh, goodness. What amazing insights that God gives. Now, i gotta, I got to go back to one part here, though, in Ezekiel. I mean, this should have been obvious in Ezekiel's prophecy. He tells you everything about how to say, I will sanctify my great name. So God's great name was not sanctified because the house of Israel was scattered abroad. That's what, it's, that's what it's saying. But he returns them home, and what does he do? And I will sprinkle clean water upon you, water baptism, and you shall be, now I do believe in baptism, okay, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also I will give you. Only Jesus Christ could do that. And a new spirit, the Holy Spirit, will I put within you, and I will take away what? The stony heart out of your flesh. You know what the stony heart is? The two tables of stone. See, God had given Israel the commandments by writing them on stones. And he said it no longer be on tables of stone. But he said, I'll write it on the tables of your heart. That's what the stony heart was. They were still under the law. And Christ come to deliver you from the law. Oh, wow. You know, they, as Paul said, they by nature, Gentiles by nature were keeping the commandments of God. It's written on their heart. That's the way it should be. Oh, my gosh. All right. Now, this is a little side note here. Uh, now, this is no throw off on Jonathan Kahn. But I have heard Jonathan Kahn speak about how that Barabbas was, that it, when they were crying out for Barabbas, that the Jews were really not doing anything bad. They were crying out for the son of the father. Baraba, Baraba, Baraba. Now, in the Greek, it appears to be that way. It does. So, I, like I said, that's why I say I'm not throwing off on Jonathan on this. But I want to point something out to you that caught my attention. This is the Hebrew Matthew. We have, I think, eight different fragments of this book. Now, granted, we have older fragments of Greek than we do of the Hebrew one. But the Hebrew one had to have been taken, as many scholars believe, from the original Hebrew. Nehemiah Gordon will tell you this as well, because as he says, you can't, the idioms in the Hebrew Matthew line up not in Greek. All right, they line up here, but they don't line up in Greek. And one of the things that I noticed in here was Barabbas' name right here. See, it says here, Pilate had a prisoner who was almost crazy. His name was Barabbas. Now, they put it Barabbas over there. But it's pronounced the same way, Shimo Barabbas. All right? But it's not spelled anything like son of the father. And in the different fragments that they used to write this, which is from one, two, three, four, they're using five different fragments here. Not one single one of those fragments ever spelled his name, Son of the Father. Instead, it's Son of Fire. Destruction. That's what he is. He was destruction. So, that's a, just a conjecture. You know, the point being is, is that we have documents. Let's examine it and see. Let's examine it and see. It's interesting. You know, so, and maybe he's right. Maybe in Greek it is son of the father. But in that case, which father was his daddy? Because Jesus said to the Pharisees, you are of your father the devil. So yeah, they were sons and they had a father, but it was not God. All right. Another prophecy I used to put in the future that was fulfilled. And I'm bringing a lot of these up, guys, and I know it's a long video, but I have to do this because this is all being taught wrong. All right, let's get into this just briefly because I've taught on this so many times. Zechariah 8, 
chapter 8, verse 22 and 23. And this is where people are always, they're putting this in the future, saying they're, they're going to take all of the skirt of a Jew and say, come, uh, you know, we hear God's with you, and you're going to show us your ways. And this is what evangelicals and messianic ministers are using to say to the Jewish, or to the Gentile Christians, you've got to learn from the Jews. Did Jesus ever tell his disciples or any of those that were in the field, go learn from the Jews? No. He was that law that came forth out of Jerusalem. That scripture was fulfilled when Christ was here. All right? Yea, many peoples and mighty nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Huh. And Jesus said, Except that you believe that I am. That in Hebrew is Ihaye, the same one that spoke to Moses at the burning bush. Except that you believe that I am. Doesn't say he in Greek. Except that you believe that I am. He said, you will die in your sins. All right? So yes, the Lord was there in Jerusalem. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, shall even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, we will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Again, right back to Acts chapter 2. They were from all the known nations of the earth at that time. All right? And they did what? Literally, it says, They will take a hold of the wing of a Jewish man singular. Now, oddly enough, it does go on and say, we will go with you, for we hear that God is with you. And that is in the plural. Those yous are in the plural. So how do you fulfill that? It's simple. Christ was that Jewish man that they took a hold of the wing. As we read in the Hebrew, Matthew, when Jesus was up in the uh, Galilee, and the, even the Syrians came to him, it says there they took a hold of Bacanop, his wing of his garment, and wanted to just know more. But when we get to, we will go with you, for we hear God is with you, that's the ten men of the nations. They're going to take all the wing of Jesus, but they're going to go with his apostles and the 120 that were in the upper room. And that's exactly what they did. They said, men and brethren, what must we do to receive this Holy Ghost? And Peter said, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, for the promises to you and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, I just paraphrase that, right? But what was it? There's your plural. But they have to take a hold of the wing of Christ. Yet another scripture fulfilled. All right. Now, this is a new doctrine that's spreading like wildfire. Synagogue of Satan. They're trying to rewrite your Bible, by the way. Those of you that love King James, they want to rewrite your Bible. They want to make sure that synagogue is no longer used. Synagogue of Satan, Revelation 2, 9, no way can't use that because that's hate speech. You know, Jesus must, if you looked at him today and today's political eyes, it would all be hate speech. This comes from a website, cgg.org. What is the synagogue of Satan? Mark Bills teaches this too, by the way. The word synagogue comes from a Greek word meaning assembly of men or congregation. And it was used much like the English word church. The synagogue of Satan then is an assembly or congregation, a church made up of individuals who say they are Jews and are not. The term Jew is used here in a spiritual sense. All right, notice how they did that. Assembly or congregation, a church. And this is what I was told that Mark Bills was teaching, that the synagogue of Satan were those Christians thinking they're Jews when they're not. Let's take a look at what Revelation 2 says. And look, this no, this not, I'm not trying to knock, beat up on Mark either. The thing is, I want to see these brethren come to the knowledge of the truth and stand and teach the truth. What a powerful force we could do if we joined our forces together. And there is a lot of men that are starting to stand up and speak for truth. A lot of them. 
I heard Steve Quill speaking on Noahide laws and 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 talking about uh, uh, Jared Kushner and that uh, you know Kabbalist ideology of theirs. That man standing up for some true things. Revelations chapter two, and the angel of the church in Smyrna write these things, saith the first and the last, which is which was dead and is alive. That's Jesus Christ. He's the one saying it, right? I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but art are, are rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Now, as the woman that wrote me the thing from the from the uh, the Israel University there. She was making the point that is it like in Revelation uh, two nine that oh they're all everybody that, uh, that that all synagogues are bad. No, that's not what Jesus is even speaking about. Those that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan, just like the Kumarite community said about those Jews that are quote unquote Jews that were running the temple in Jerusalem were all sons of darkness. It's no different than synagogue of Satan if you want to get right down to the terminology. Okay? Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. All right, so we've established Jesus is saying it, and he's talking about, I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. He, the reason it's blasphemy is because he knows they were not real Jews when he was there. Let's prove that point. All right? Matthew chapter 10. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. You know, as I have it right here, the word councils here in Greek is Sanhedrin. Oh, what do you know? And they will scourge you in their synagogues. They deliver you to the Sanhedrin. They claim to be Jews. The Pharisees and the Sadducees that ran that Sanhedrin, they claim to be Jews, and they're the ones that are going to scourge you in their synagogue. So outside of the council or the Sanhedrin, they also scourge you in their synagogues. So when Jesus says... Beware of them, or, or let's go back to it, get it right. See? I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Well, Jesus already identified that they were not of God, that they were, as he said, you are of your father the devil. There's your synagogue of Satan. All right? So, yeah, if you want to translate it assembly, sure, they were an assembly of devils. All right? Now, also, just to make a point, though, for those that try to say that the word synagogue was not really, because that's another argument they make. Well, synagogue was ne re really never used until after the Second Temple. Synagogue is still used to this day, and it was used before the destruction of the Second Temple. I'll prove it real quick. Chabad.org, right? Chabad.org says here, who invented the synagogue? I've heard it said that there, uh, there is no mention of synagogue in the Torah. So where... And when did it originate? It's hard to imagine Judaism, at least as we know it today, without a synagogue, without synagogues. Whoop, excuse me. The answer, indeed, there is no mention in the synagogue in the written Torah. Notice he says written Torah, i.e. five books of Moses. The institution of the synagogue is of latter rabbinic origin. The purpose of synagogue is to provide a venue to facilitate and enhance the biblical obligation prayer by adding communal element. All right? So, Right there by Chabad's website, they admit that the Jewish people actually instituted the synagogue. All right? It goes on to say, There arose both in Israel and in the diaspora places set aside to pray communally. Thus was born the place of gathering. Beit Knesset in Hebrew or synagogues in Greek. The primary public worship experience remained in the, the journey to Jerusalem to participate and be inspired by the temple service. When the Romans destroyed the second temple in 69 CE, the only place of public worship remained in the synagogue, which then acquired increased importance as a center of Jewish communal life. Their own statement shows that they believed that the synagogues were post and pre-temple destruction. All right, let's move forward with more of this. So, Jewish worship 
pagan symbols. This is under biblicalarchaeology.org. The next several websites will also contain that. But watch what it says. Zodiac messianics in ancient synagogues. Right here, they're showing you an ancient synagogue that was actually uh, unearthed in Israel around the 500, something like that. Uh, uh, excuse me, not, it wasn't unearthed then. Uh, that's how old it was, 5th century. Uh, it was actually discovered in 1928. A work crew from the kibbutz uh, Beit Alpha discovered this synagogue, uh, a Jewish house of worship in a basilica building that dates to around 520 BC. Uh, uh, excuse me, CE, common era is what they put in there. Uh, but at any rate, they know it was Jewish because of the menorahs, etc. that you see on there. You can read that for yourself a little bit later if you want. They go on to say, though, inside the article here, now, of course, we have problems. We know that Jewish life moved to Galilee after the total destruction of Jewish Jerusalem that followed the Bar Kokhba revolt of, uh, of the uh, 130s CE in the Common Era. We are therefore not surprised to have found and to keep finding synagogues from the following centuries all over the Galilee and Golan. It isn't the synagogues themselves that are a problem. Uh, it's the decorations in them. What in heaven's name were they doing? How could they be making pictures, especially in the synagogues? Didn't they, they know the commandment? Uh, the second commandment, you shall not make yourself graven images uh, or likenesses, what is in heaven above or the earth below or the waters underneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve serve them. See, so they're quoting the, 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 the commandment there, but it was interesting. Then they go on to say, if you take a fine-tooth comb and you begin to dig through... Uh, through 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 uh well let me just read it it is true that one who goes through jewish literature with a fine-tooth comb can find a citation here and there that seems to recognize the phenomenon of mosaic decoration presumably zodiac and synagogues in the days of rabbi abun they began depicting figures in mosaic and he did not protest against it more to the point we find in the Aramaic translation, you may place a mosaic pavement impressed with figures and images in the floors of a synagogue, but not for bowing down to it. There is even a midrash that attempts to justify the zodiac phenomena. Okay, so they go on to show that yes, this was a Jewish practice back in those days. But also we have here ancient synagogues in Israel and in the diaspora, uh, which is very similar to what the Chabad website is saying. A synagogue is a place depict, uh, dedicated uh, to Jewish worship and instruction. These buildings became the primary place of Jewish worship after the temple was destroyed in 70 CE, but were their ancient synagogues in Israel and in the diaspora while the temple still stood in Jerusalem. Now here's the answer to that question. This is by Professor uh, Rachel Chachalil uh, of the University of Haifa. All right. Now she states here, uh, explains that there is some debate as to whether or not synagogues existed before uh, the Roman destruction of the temple in 70 CE. On the one hand, we have textual evidence such as the New Testament that identifies certain structures of synagogues where Torah, for, uh, where Torah reading, teaching, and prayer took place. For example, in Mark 121, she gives that example. But if you go into the next paragraph, she says, additionally, we have uncovered buildings from the second temple period before the destruction of the temple 70 CE that look similar to post-destruction post-destruction synagogues. Latter synagogues were sometimes built on top of these earlier structures, thereby suggesting a continuity of use. That is what we see at Capernaum, by the way. All right, the Golan synagogue dates to the second temple period before the Roman destruction of the temple in 70 CE, as a note in there. And that's the one that most people go to see in Capernaum. And if you remember, if you've ever been there, there's black stones under the bottom that those limestones were put on top of. Uh, so it was definitely pre-temple destruction period. But what really is critical evidence is this particular stone right here discovered in Israel, and it was actually discovered around the 18th uh, or 18, uh, 18 BC, before Christ ever was even born. That stone was discovered in Israel, and this is what it says on the stone. Theodotus, the son of Vitnus, priest and archai synagogus, son of the Archai Synagogus, grandson of an Archai Synagogus, built the synagogue. The word synagogue is all over that particular stone dated 18 years before Christ ever come. So yes, synagogues were very much prominent in that day. And no, Jesus never meant, uh, even in Revelation 2, that all synagogues were evil or that all Jews were evil, but they hated 
those that claim to be Jews and are not. All right, so let's take a look at why we get this. Matthew chapter 7, as we brought up at the beginning, if you remember that, we shared with you this at the beginning of this broadcast, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Romans chapter 2, for example, all right, Paul says, For he is not a Jew which is, is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, and not in the letter whose praise uh, is not of men, but of God. All right, John chapter 8 then really begins to drive this whole point home. But now you seek to kill me. This is Jesus speaking. A man that hath told you the truth. He's talking to the Pharisees. Which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. You did the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, and neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do you understand not my understand, excuse me, why, why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? If I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's word. Ye therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. That's pretty strong words. Now why is he saying that about them? Now notice though, uh, verse 41, when he said to them, a man that told you the truth, I, I heard of God, this did not Abraham, Two things. One, Jesus was saying that he, had, he was the one that spoke to Abraham. And then he goes, he says, you do the deeds of your father. So he was showing they were not of Abraham. Then they jumped to the conclusion, we've been not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Why were they saying they were not born of fornication? Because of Ezra 9. They knew that in Ezra 9, that the priest, according to Ezra 9, now when these things were done, the princes drew near unto me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people's land, doing according to their abominations. The peoples of the lands. Not Babylonians now. What was it? Canaanites, Hittites, Perzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, and Amorites. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed, which was the priest, have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. Yea, the hand of the princes and the rulers have been first in this faithfulness, faithlessness. They mixed their bloodlines. All right? Now, some people say, oh, the peoples of the land. You know, one minister, he said to me, he says, no, he said, Steve, he said, they separated from them and they sent them back to their people. And I said, so they just stayed there in Babylon. Yeah, 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 they stayed there in Babylon. I said, no, they didn't. We know this because according to the Cyrus Cylinder, Cyrus sent all the peoples back to their original lands to serve their gods back in their own lands. That included Perzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Moabites, Egyptians, Amorites, etc., they all went back to their lands. They were living amongst the Jewish people when they came there in bondage. But they still knew, they still knew how to bring those Nephilim bloodlines into this world. And when they mingled this seed, now the priest became mixed in with those groups. Now, interesting point to make note of though. Um, I think as Judas Maccabee, it's written of him that when he put on his armor, he looked like a giant. I always thought that was interesting. But let's look at the, who these Perzites, Jebusites, Ammonites, Canaanites, notice Canaanites as well. All right, let's just look for, for example. Numbers 13, this is when the, the 10 spies went over. Caleb and Joshua were the two that were faithful. But when they came back, the other 
uh, 12, was it 12, 10 spies, I guess 10 spies, the rest of them came back, they were saying, oh, we can't do it. We were like grasshoppers in their sight, right? Verse 31 we pick up with, Numbers 13. But the men went up with him, said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they spread an evil report of the land which they had spied out unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have passed to spy it out is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. Cannibalism. What did Jesus say is going to happen in this day here? As it was in the days of, of the or as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. They were eating, drinking, giving in marriage. And I said, Enoch said they were eating flesh, drinking blood, and they were mingling the seed. Well, there you go, right here. The inhabitants eateth up the, oh, excuse me, the land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof, and all the people that we saw are in it are men of great stature, giants, like it was before the flood. And there we saw the Nephilim, sons of Enoch, who came, or who come, of the, that should be Nephilim, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, so we were in their sight. Anak, by the way, was a Canaanite. All right? And literally in Hebrew, he was from Min ha nephalim Forget the vowel points. Moses spelled it without the Yod. Here, Anak's sons, by the way, Anak's sons were fallen ones, Nephilim, as they were called, but not Anak. His father was one of the fallen angels, directly all right that's why he said don't learn after their ways we also have had this in genesis 6 the sons of god saw the daughters of men that they were fair and took to themselves wives whomsoever they chose wow that's before that's during pre pre flood time all right and in verse 4 now in king james you have the giants but it's it's right here the nephilim Again, shouldn't be Nephilim, it should be Nephilim because there's no Yod there, so the vowel points are wrong. Hayu Ba'aretz, the, the Nephilim were in the earth in those days, the fallen angels. And also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, they bore children to them. The same were the mighty men were of old, the men of renown. That's Nephilim. All right, now it doesn't call them Nephilim over there, not in the bottom portion here. But he does say that they were that the fallen angels were there at that time. And they're called sons of God in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Think about that. But when we get to the book of Jude, Jude gives us a different picture. Jude says also, this is how we know that when they came back from the days of Jesus and they'd come from the land of Babylon, undoubtedly they began to get smaller in stature. Because Jude says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Not the common salvation, but the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unaware, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. How can you be preordained to condemnation? He's talking about the Nephilim. Nephilim. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. That's harlotry. Mingling the seed again. I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not, and the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Wow. Chains under darkness. You know, being in the body is also considered being in darkness, especially if you do not have the Holy Spirit. We're almost ready to close. I want to just share with you a few of these fragments from... from uh, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls to kind of make the point go home in closing here. This one right here I wanted to bring to your attention because this is this was a writing uh, considered an apocrypha of Moses. It is 4Q 390 and 391 and he writes here that the time would come. He's speaking about the priest. Moses writing this long before it ever happened. All right. He says here um, 
I'm not going to read the whole thing. They will rule over them, and they will not know and, and will not understand that I am enraged towards them for their disloyalty, with which they will desert me and do what is evil in my eyes. What I do not like, they have chosen, domineering for money, for advantage, and for violence. And each will steal what belongs to one's neighbor, and they will oppress one another. They will defile my temple, they will defile my Sabbaths, and they will forget my festivals with, 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 with the sons of foreigners. They will, literally it says, they say here, debase their offspring, but it's actually, they will debase their seed. Mingling their seed, in other words. We also see this as well. This is another interesting thing, and this also goes to the idea that uh, to, uh, yeah, Tovia Singer says there's no such thing as the word seeds, plural, that was in usage back then. Well, they did use it in the plural as well, zarim, right here. And it's interesting because it's specific. Watch what he says here. You know that a part of the priest and the people mingle, and they unite with each other and defile the holy seed. Now, in that case there, the HaKodesh, Zara HaKodesh, the holy seed, that's the coming of Christ. Because they should have stayed pure until he came. But then it goes further. Et zarim im hazanot. Right? And their own seed with harlots. It puts seeds in the plural. Why? Because in that case, they don't carry the seed of the Messiah. They don't carry the faith of the Messiah. But they mingle it. And once they mingle the true faith of Abraham, the true faith seed of Sarah, the true faith seed of literally Mary, who's the one that really believed the word of God that produced the Messiah, the true faith seed of David, Jacob, etc., that brought all this down. But they all missed it. Let's quickly go through this and close. They did not keep apart from the sins and have rebelled with insolence, walking on the path of wicked, one, wicked ones, about whom God said, Their wine is serpent's venom and cruel poison of ass. The serpents are the kings and the people, their wine is their pass. The ass poison is the head of the kings of Greece who comes upon them to execute vengeance. Oh, gosh. I won't go into that right now. That would be pretty lengthy to get into. But uh, this will sum it up. We're going to close right here. Matthew 23. Even so also outwardly appear, uh, uh, outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the, 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 the sepulchres of the righteous. And say, if we had been in the days of our fathers, we would have not been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which killed the prophets. Fill you up then the measure of your fathers. Ye you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? The Hebrew Matthew literally says to them that they were serpents, seed of vipers. And that's interesting in the Hebrew when it talks about the vipers, or, or the serpents and the vipers both. And the chashim, they were pluralized in there, and they're there. But they were, and this it does a singular word for uh, seed there. Why? Because it's Satan's offspring. Zara safanim. There you go. They're serpents. Listen, I know this has been a lengthy message and I want to thank you for uh, having the patience to listen to this entire message. And I want to thank you, thank you for those of you that support this broadcast because without you, we can't make it. And uh, we're truly living in a very, very tumultuous time. I believe, as I shared with you at the beginning, that Antarctica is beginning to melt down. And I would not be a bit surprised if that doesn't loose those fallen angels from their prison. Because remember, Satan is loosed for a short season. Short season. Because power was given over to the beast. But then judgment follows. And God judges that devil. 
So, the scripture says he's loosed from his pit. And now that Antarctica is melting off, watch that video I did on it. I showed you at the beginning. Watch that video. He's being loosed to come out. We're about to see some fireworks like we ain't never seen before. If you've never been prayed up, you need to pray up now. If you want to support our broadcast, please do. Ganoon Institute. Our address, 8297 Champions Gate Boulevard. We appreciate it. You can visit our website, IsraeliNewsLive.org. You can donate online or by mail. Either way. If you want to make it out to us personally, we appreciate it. Stephen Ben Noon, B-E-N hyphen N-U-N.